Characterization can make or break a character. Do this right, and the character will be a joy to see in action and interact with the rest of the cast, because it's clear that the character had thought put into them. A great example of this is the Rule of One series. Yeah, sci-fi dystopias with teenagers as the main characters aren't exactly original, but the characters themselves are make the story. Take even one of the main or secondary characters out of the story and things would be drastically different for Ava and Mira. Do this wrong and people cannot grasp onto the character because it's obvious that they're poorly written and they are not engaging to your audience. An example is this pilot, where the story could be so much more if the characters weren't so bland and one-dimensional and 90% of them could be replaced by inanimate objects. When the story fails, people fall back into the characters, but when a majority of the characters fail to grab your attention, not even a great story can save it. First off, I'll start with some explanations. The main question is, what is characterization and how do you define it? Characterization, as defined by ReadWriteThink.org, is the process by which the writer reveals the personality of a character. Obviously, this is referring to written media. Since video games are a bit different, I'll be talking about the following. Personality, character dialogue slash voice acting, animation, role in the main story, and actions. Why did I choose this game in particular? One thing I adore about Crash 4 is the characters and how they're portrayed. This aspect in particular makes Crash 4 the perfect candidate for this topic. I also want to be able to properly explain why I love these characters and by extent their portrayal in this game. When I first saw the opening cutscene, I knew that there was something special here. For the sake of keeping this video focused and relatively short, I'll be focusing on one particular video game that I'm currently obsessed with. Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. For the sake of time, no pun intended. I'll also be leaving out some characters that really didn't have much to go off of. I'll use other examples from the franchise to prove my point, but my main focus is on Crash 4. Just When Entropy rats out Cortex for not helping Uka Uka to get them out of the time prison, the background music is opposing and sinister, which makes for great foreshadowing. For some context, the opening cutscene continues years after Crash 3, where Cortex and Entropy got stuck in a time prison and were turned to babies as a result. The tone is set beautifully when you see Cortex standing on a fiery cliff about to shoot Crash, but as it turns out, it's not actually Crash. At least Uka Uka and I attempt to free us from this prison. I won't sit idly by and listen to your inane ramblings for another decade. Chew. There are so many little details such as the 22 tally marks in the rock being a callback to when Crash 3 released back in 1998, and the stretching noises when Entropy gets down to Cortex's level. When Uka Uka dies, Cortex tenses up and keeps his distance. The Crash Bandicoot franchise is no stranger to in-game cutscenes, but in Crash 4 they utilize much more. I find that Crash 4 gets many things right with the cutscenes, one of which is that the cutscenes don't feel forced and the interactions are natural. With the exception of the original trilogy, I find the cutscenes tend to feel stiff. Like, look at this! I don't feel engaged or interested in what's going on! There's no audio, but you're not missing much. Unlike the last cutscene, nothing is actually happening here. It's just a board being that just goes on. And on. And on. You've gotta be kidding, they're still talking! You know what? Let's just move on. Another problem is that later down the line, many of the cutscenes don't have anything going on. It's just going back and forth with characters talking and barely moving. The animation isn't used to its fullest potential, and for certain characters, different emotions are almost impossible to decipher. This game is visually stunning and a breath of fresh air when compared to the visual mixed bag is the Insane Trilogy. Crash 4 actually has its own charming art style as it's trying to be realistic. Allow me to go on a bit of a tangent with the remakes. For those of you that don't know, the Insane Trilogy remastered collection of first three Crash games. Crash 1, Cortex Strikes Back, and Warped. I find the Insane Trilogy art style be downright ugly, especially when compared to Crash 4 and I finally have a reason for this. The former is trying to adhere to realism and lose stylized graphics, which simply doesn't work for a cartoony series like Crash Bandicoot. Because of this, the character models tend to be hit or miss. Some of the character models look great, such as Tiny Tiger, Hana, and Cortex, but others are anywhere from why was this design choice made to oh god, put them out of their misery already. Here, there's much more consistency with the character designs. 
This time there's a proper lighting engine so everybody looks wonderful and the character models actually have a leg to stand on. The animations and character designs are very exaggerated and cartoony in the best way possible. The original vision for this franchise was taking all the charm from a cartoon and translating that into a video game. The later games is mostly forgot about this, but Crash 4 keeps the original vision intact and builds upon it. The animations and cutscenes are the vibe of Looney Tunes or Animaniacs, which is probably why I find the animation just so fun to watch. The character models lend themselves beautifully to a vast array of movement and expressions. I mean, just look at these designs! Nicholas Cole, the main concept artist, knew what he was doing and did a phenomenal job. Squash and stretch is utilized beautifully, which is something that is used in a lot of older cartoons in 2D animation. It's seldom used in 3D animation, and as far as I know, Crash 4 is the only recent example I can think of that uses squash and stretch in 3D animation. For those of you that are unaware with animation terms, squash and stretch is a fundamental in animation that's defined as applying a contrasting change of shape while still making the object recognizable. This is done in order to give flexibility and breathe life into animation to avoid rigid and stiff movements. Thanks to the abundant use of squash and stretch, the characters are the most expressive they've ever been, which is especially the case for Coco, Cortex, and Entropy. As well as being more expressive, these three characters went through a pretty significant change in character and are the most prominent examples of a change in a long-established character for the better and how characterization works in favor of this change. Interrupt, but existence could end at any minute, so can we hurry? Now that we found Ika Ika, that's all four. What's next? For the longest time, Coco is just your run of the mill, annoying sibling combined with your stereotypical kid genius who sounded a little too much like Jimmy Neutron. It's almost finished. A few little adjustments here and there, and it'll be ready to go. Well, the pattern I've concluded from deductive reasoning is that whoever stole the power gems has some connection to Wampa Whip. The big difference here is that she's working alongside Crash, as shown by the fact that she's playable in all the same levels that he is. She's much more animated and expressive, and has a full set of emotions, which was a problem in earlier games, as she went from the annoying kid genius to ditzy teenager, and didn't have much room to act out of these roles. Her design didn't change too much from the Insane Trilogy, but it thinks that were added to her gave some nice touches to her character, such as the goggles, her tool belt, and changing her laptop to a tablet, which solidified her as a mechanic. To be honest, I never really cared much about Debbie Dairyberry's role as Coco, and much prefer Ian and Rigel, simply because it sounds better to me. She's meant to be Crash's opposite, and she does join in about his antics, but it's made clear she's more level-headed and the voice of reason for the protagonist. She's always been a spokesman for Crash, but she's more of a main character than just an afterthought now, as she actually interacts with other characters. She more or less has the same role of Crash in the story, and shows the same enthusiasm as him when going on adventures. Crash Bandicoot, it's about time. This is going to be just like the old days. Except this time, everything will go according to my plan. <laughs> Cortex has always been the main antagonist in the Crash series, and that much hasn't changed. Unlike most of the characters, Cortex didn't change voice actors as Lex Lang is still the one voice skimp, and as always, he does a fantastic job. In regard to his design, he changed quite a bit. His head was rounded off instead of being completely flat like it was in most games. He was getting more sophisticated and, dare I say, handsome build. Even his animations and movements show this. Apparently, Paul was balancing his new design while still making the animations feel like Cortex and not making him, and I quote, too handsome. Another change to his design is making his hair express his emotions, and I love that this choice was made. His personality goes through a massive change as well. He changes sides throughout the game, which only happened one other time in the series. He's tired and stressed from possibly losing the Crash at Coco, which is something that has never been explored in a previous game. I find this aspect of his personality adds a touch of reliability to him, because there's nothing more soul-crushing than constantly working towards a goal than failing again and again. When he loses, he pretty much begs for even Crash to stop fighting. So when he's defeated for the fourth time, he becomes very upset and tells Entropy that he quits and is taking a vacation. More salt is rubbed into the wound when Entropy's all like, Oh, by the way, I don't need you anymore. I'm becoming a god now and resetting the universe. Hope you enjoy non-existence. This was the nail in the coffin for Cortex, 
So we jumped to the chance to join Crash and Coco so that I can stop their endless cycle of fighting while also taking the chance to beat up and stop Entropy. It seems like he doesn't want to be seen as the villain anymore, which would have been an interesting route to take. But of course, when an opportunity arises for him to bury his greatest mistake once and for all, aka Crash, it proves to be his undoing. Considering the scope of Cortex's character, the story could have gone either way and still worked. Hasten your steps! By my calculations, our enemies are already moving against us. And we will prevail. I'm just gonna say this now. I'm pretty sure this character alone is the reason why I'm obsessed with this game, so obviously this section is going to be biased. Entropy seems like he had potential since his introduction because he came off as more serious and imposing than other villains, but he wasn't exactly expressive or reacting to the things going on around him. He was kind of just there. His personality and motives weren't really looked into. Now he's the main bad guy, he's much more sinister, deluded, and deranged to boot. And since he was stuck in a time prison with Cortex and a floating evil piece of wood for god knows how long, this fits really well. Hey, who said character development had to be positive? And thanks to his new voice actor, J.P. Karliak, makes him sound the part, too. Of course. The Rift Generator has capabilities beyond your meager imagination. You are content to simply rule over space and time, but I'd rather start from scratch, erase it all. Wipe the slate clean. I'm going to reset the timeline and rebuild it to my liking. I will become a god, which means you won't exist. And neither will those feather brains lost or those meddling marsupials. <laughs> because of his voice alone, I almost want to forget all the crimes he's committed. His actual threat is time round, and honestly, this change in character was for the better. And spoiler alert, he betrays Cortex because he wants full interdimensional control and wants everyone dead. So, he keeps up with an ultra-dimension version of himself, and things get up. How do I keep this PG? Things get weird between them. Questionable relationship aside, the two of them will stop at nothing to become God and erase everybody from existence. Yeah, he's pompous, narcissistic, and overall a garbage person, but it's so fun to watch him in action, since his character model especially. It looks wonderful now that his character design is more simplified, this is probably the best he's ever looked. His crash war design is top tier, since it keeps the integrity of his design intact. You can still tell what he's all about with a less cluttered design. He's very expressive now, and especially love how his face moves. There's something about his odd combination of facial features and how they're animated is very pleasing to look at, in my opinion. He's much more serious and much more a threat to other evil doctors because of his time related abilities and general demeanor. I mean, the dude's name is literally nefarious. You expect him not to be evil? What's the matter, hero? Couldn't solo this one? Let her go! Since I mentioned female entropy, I might as well talk about her even though she has very little screen time, has some of the most wasted potential out of everyone, and had an underwhelming debut in general. Let's just get this out of the way first. She plays next to no role in the story. She's the one that replaced Cortex in this whole interdimensional domination plan, but we unfortunately don't get to see any of this on screen, and it's barely mentioned. She's brought up for a single joke in a pre-boss fight cutscene, and then disappears, which is a huge letdown because as a character, she seems so promising. An alternate dimension version of an already established character? Sign me up! What was shown of her personality could have been explored much more. What we do know is that she's very sadistic, more cruel than Entropy, and has killed at least two people. Okay, they're not exactly people, but still. Her victims are the Crash of Coco back in her dimension. Well, she doesn't exactly say it, but since she's staring down Tata and casually mentions... The last time I killed her friends, her screams were exquisite. Huh? Delicious. You can easily guess who she's talking about. This is such a big deal because she's the only character in the Crash universe that has been confirmed to have actually killed anyone. 
And with this little tidbit of information, there are so many possibilities for her backstory. For the most part, Crash as a Whole has been relatively lighthearted and fun, and then this plot twist makes the series a little darker. I'm all for it, but that might be because I'm edgy. Once again, I cannot praise the voice actors enough. Sarah Tanser did a fabulous job, the female entropy's voice is just fun to listen to. She sounds elegant and, dare I say, soothing. In some lines, you can hear and feel her sadistic and cruel nature creeping in. In my universe, bandicoots are considered pests, as fit for extermination as a housefly. Oh, how modern. Tell me more. Some keep them as pets, but I find it disgusting. I much prefer So many little legs to pull. Allow me to take a minute to talk about her design. Once again, I cannot praise these character designs enough. There's something about black and gold together that I love, so female entropy is one of my favorites by default. Also, this is gonna sound weird, but I love her facial structure. She's so pretty, I just can't handle it. Okay, we get it! Stop sipping for fictional characters! There are some smaller changes that also make her distinct from Entropy, such as giving her a time machine a more sleek and less boxy design, giving her a slightly more futuristic vibe with use of the brighter green or clock faces, and changing the shape of her headgear and pistons, and those eyes. For whatever reason, I just gravitate towards characters with unusual eye and skin colors. I just love how she's animated. Look at how she moves, it's just so elegant. Once again, I wish we saw more of her. You said it, Crash. We can meet with the others after we've explored. Now, which way are the food trucks? As for the titular character, he's meant to be a silent, big dumb idiot with the heart of gold, and unlike some of the later games, this is actually obvious here. Crash is the main protagonist, and this is probably the most likable he's ever been. Just look at him, he's precious! From the cutscenes and animations during gameplay, you can tell what his personality is about. He's a wacky, goofy, fearless character who loves danger. He's also relatively laid back and prefers to relax. A big part of his personality that was emphasized more in Crash 4 is his willingness to help others, his impulsiveness, attentiveness to others, and lack of ill will to his enemies. Even though Cortex has tried to kill Crash multiple times, Crash loves the idea of then teaming up and doesn't see Cortex's betrayal coming when literally every other character does. And the wonderful thing about Crash is that he has very expressive body language, and you can tell what he's feeling or thinking by body language alone. Just because he doesn't speak, that doesn't mean that he can't express things. Emotionally, he's an open book and does not hold back. This time around, the noises that Crash makes don't make you wish you were deaf, unlike some games that will remain unnamed. He sounds goofy and silly without being annoying. Regarding his design, it changed a lot to fit the more cartoony environment. Compared to his insane trilogy design, his ears are bigger and have more of a softer edge, his eyes are larger, and he isn't shaped like a triangle anymore. His color palette has changed a lot too. Instead, using that disgusting, oversaturated red and blocky eyebrows from the insane trilogy, he's back to a softer orange and his eyebrows, while still large, have actual shape to them. And there you have it. I went through what characterization is and how it's the bread and butter of every story while using examples of good and bad characterization from other types of media. It's much more important than people think. I feel that I was able to back up my points well and provide sufficient definitions and evidence so that anybody can understand what I'm talking about while mixing in some of my own opinions and imagining to be somewhat entertaining.